So I want to talk to you about scientific posters, academic posters in general. So the poster is a particular form of expression of ideas. Similar to a paper is a form of expressing ideas. A presentation is another way of expressing ideas. These are different formats or or genres, or these are not quite the right word, but they're different modalities of expression. And each modality has its own strengths and weaknesses. If you try to just take what you know about one and pour it into the other, often you'll just, you won't get any benefit from that. You need to think about the distinctive strengths and weaknesses of each medium on its own terms. Now, whenever I think about a form of expression and what it might do for me, the if all they, the benefits the potential benefits fall into two categories. One, communication. Most of these things we're doing for primarily, or at least our our the motivation which is foremost in our mind is communication. But there's another important one, and that's construction. In communication. There's me, I have, you know, an idea, it's square. I have square ideas because I'm a very boring person. And I would like someone else to have that idea as well. But at the moment, you know, they don't have that idea. It's, it's, it's not in there. And so the way that I get it from me to them is I create a physical, external, tangible expression of the idea. Let's say a poster. Now, inevitably, the translation from things in my head to things on the page are going to look a little bit different. They're, they're, perfect fidelity is never possible. But at least in principle now, from my thoughts to the page, from the page into theirs in some form, maybe with some loss or issue. So that's pretty clear, that's normal, that's how we think about it. And of course, this thought might be, this communication might be with future me. But the key notion of communication is transmission. You're taking something that potentially you think is well-formed, fully formed, developed, and you're trying to convey it to someone else. Something of a simplification, but good enough for government work here. And the construction, I'm going to do with the case of single person construction because you can meld these two when you're doing collaboration or interaction. Maybe I have an idea, oh, but you know, it's a mess. Uh, I, maybe some parts haven't been thought out. Maybe I don't fully understand it. Maybe it just feels vague. I'm sure you've had that moment where you say, I have this idea, but I, I, I can't say it. Um, so what we do is we try to put it on paper in some form, some external tangible representation on our whiteboard. And when we see that, when we see what we've, what we've done, that tells us something about our idea and about our expression of it. And maybe this was just the wrong thought. Now notice in this case, we don't already have a thought that we're trying to get someplace else. The thought is wrong. And by making it physical, it helps us realize and think through that the thought is wrong. So then we try again. Oh, maybe, maybe it's circular. No, 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 that's wrong. The circle thought is wrong. And then we get to finally, oh, a square. And now that's the right thought. And that's the thought we wanted to have. Now, of course, this expression might then serve well as a communicative artifact. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it only makes sense to me. Maybe it only helps me come to the realization and I still have to do more work. But often these are one and the same thing. And that's the point of posters in the symposium. The point of us having you do posters in the symposium is dual. It's the first and most important aspect of it is constructive. Okay, there's a little bit of, you know, you'll be doing posters in the future, so you should have your first encounter with it, blah, 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 blah. That's not actually as important because without knowing why you would ever want to do a poster, without going through the process of doing a poster usefully, the fact that you have to do posters in the future, just you won't get any benefit from doing one now. If you're just doing the tick box, tick box 
poster thing without any thought or effort or understanding, then you will get no benefit out of it. But the first and most critical thing is for you to crystallize your ideas, or at least to start down that process. This poster, if you're in your first year, this poster may not get you to a fully crystallized thought because you have a lot more to think through, a lot more to learn, more background, more discussion. It's just a starting point, but it should move you down the line. And then you want it to communicate your more crystallized idea to other people, people you might not encounter ordinarily. People in the department who could give you something back, who just by learning what you're doing might have useful knowledge that would be difficult for you to get otherwise. So there's a bit of, here's what I'm doing. Got anything that might be helpful? And of course, the act of communication tends to be constructive as well. The more times you try to explain it to different people, you have to change the way you use your physical art, your, your fixed artifact, um, because your performance has to adapt to the reality of this fixed artifact and different audiences. There will be lots of different people with different backgrounds. So both the, cons the construction of the artifact, the making of the artifact, and the sharing of it, the performance involving it, can have beneficial effects to your own understanding. And that's what we're aiming for. Now, not every way of doing a poster is going to have these effects. If you just say, oh, I got this LaTeX template, I have a paper, I'm just going to dump the paper into the template. You know, you'll see these, I'm sure you'll see plenty of these around, you know, the title is a long title from the paper, and then you have these blocks. This is the introduction, actually I've seen sometimes abstract, introduction, background, and, they, and, and people who are using this, you know, method, results, conclusion, and each of these is an abstract of the corresponding part of the paper. No, 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 a thousand times no, this is not a helpful thing. There, this is, this does not, just takes no advantage of the, of the poster format. It just says, I have a paper, I will cram it into a smaller word length, and I'm done. Well, did you really get much from doing that? You might have gotten a little from the summary process, but you probably already have pretty good ideas of the, the summarization of those sections uh, in the building of the paper. And at least for communication, it's not that great for communication. If I'm walking along and I see a poster like that, I'm going to keep walking. Why? Because there's very little information that's coming to me from the po this poster. And it's unlikely that I want to stand. Now, usually posters are this big. So, you know, oh, I, got, you know I got arthritis, people. <laughs> it hurts me to bend over for very long. Having to read, this is not, it's not a good reading medium. It's not something for me to, to go through a bunch of text here and then go through a bunch of text here, particularly when you've had to leave out a lot. If I want to read your paper, give me your paper. Don't put it up on, the, on a poster and pretend that it's a poster. This is not useful for anyone. Similarly, I sometimes see people, I have seen it, not so much in the symposium, but I have seen it at, at conferences, actually, who they say, oh, well, mm, yes, you know, I can't just take my paper and put it into a poster because poster's more visual, it's different, I have to think, and it's, it, it involves some interaction, so there's a presentation. Oh, I know, I'll take my presentation and turn that into a poster by putting the slides, just shrinking them down. Yay, I have a poster. Well, no, I mean, this still, I mean, in some technical sense, you've produced a physical thing, which is the sort is you know typically A3, A4. So, and you're going to post it to a wall, so it's a poster. But this is not a constructive approach to your poster. You didn't look at the poster and say, "Oh, there's something new and different here." No, you just took your presentation, your presentation where each of these was designed to be the whole focus of your attention. You know, presentations are meant to be read sequentially, and they're meant to be read with this, the whole thing up, and I do, I do a little dance around slide one, and then I move to slide two. And I might have some progressive display inside the slide. 
The poster just says, there they all are. Would you like me to talk talk you through your talk? I mean, you're not going to do your talk this way. Why would you think that doing a mini version of your presentation with an extremely poor projection mechanism would be a good idea? It's not going to be good communication. And the process of doing that, while quick and easy, in one sense, you didn't have to do a lot to do that if you already had the presentation. If you had the presentation, this is nasty. But you're typically not going to get anything new. It's not, a, it's not going to help you think through things in a better way because basically you didn't do any new thinking. You didn't take advantage of the kinds of thinking that you only get from a poster. If this is what you're going to do, just do a presentation. And by the way, not only is this not a good communicative me medium, because if somebody is here, they're, you're, not you're not taking advantages of the communication opportunities that this has, you're also going to have less communication. Because when I see this kind of poster, or the other kind of poster, my first thought isn't, oh, I, I wonder what they're working on. My first thought is, oh, well, I guess I have to take them aside and tell them how terrible their poster is, and that's not fun. So... People who are experienced, people who maybe are the people you most want to come talk with you, aren't going to be as engaged because you didn't do anything to engage them. And this just says, I don't either don't know or don't care about presenting my work in a way that's appropriate for the medium I was given. And for people who aren't very experienced, then they're not going to get you much anyway because you can't really take them through this in any useful way. You might get, yeah, oh, huh, or with a big text one, they might, oh, that's a lot of text. But you're not going to actually be able to take them to a point where they can give you something back. So if you're going to do this kind of poster, just don't bother. This is a box ticking exercise. You literally tick the box of having produced a poster. That's not what we're about. We want... I want you to get something new, and I want your posters to do something useful. And that's what you should want, too. Okay, so, so what makes a poster interesting and distinct from presentations and papers? So the primary novelty, the fundamental novelty, well, there's several, but one of the most important aspects of it is that posters unlike papers, unlike presentations, are essentially two-dimensional, right? The poster, so let me draw something that's roughly poster-sized here. The poster lays it all out in a unified display. And that's something you should be keeping in mind. Now, of course, usually your poster is going to have too much stuff on it for anybody to take the whole thing in at a glance in all of its detail there's still going to be some exploration of the poster. But because it's two-dimensional, the spatiality, you can exploit the spatiality in a variety of ways. And that's what you should be thinking of when you, when you do this. When you have a paper or when you have a presentation, you have a lot more control of how people encounter the information. Um, more direct control. Okay, with a paper, people can and do skip around, but most people know that if they're having trouble, they start from the beginning and they read through to the end. With a the presentation, they can't skip ahead. So they have a lot of control. With a poster, that's not true. With a poster, you have to think more of how to direct people, what kind of cues and clues you're going to give for them to explore your topic. And that means you really have to think about it. Now, the first thing that you should be thinking about, oh, so that gets to the, sec sorry, gets to the second fundamental uh, feature of posters, right? Posters are not dense representations or dense expressions. You cannot expect to put, just like with a slide, you can't put as much information. You know, if you put too much information in the slide, people look at the slide and go, ah, I can't read it. That's why we use bullet points that are bullet points. We don't use whole sentences typically if, if you're nice to your audience. Um, the, the, the density, the granularity, the, f the fidelity even of what you're trying to convey is not, is not as precise in either of these mediums. And you have to remember that that's the case. So a big part of a presentation or a poster is thinking about what you're going to leave out. Now, some of that you can defer to your interaction, just like in a presentation, when you say stuff, you can say more than is what's on your 
your slide. The slide is there to support what you're saying. Your, your speech is the primary river of information of where the of, of where most things are coming from and the poster that's often true as well if you're standing there if you're not standing there or if you're talking to somebody and somebody else goes by you still have to make the poster useful to those people who are not going to get much of your interaction so that's very important the poster needs to work at a high level of extraction at a big chunkiness level you can have some bits that are a little more detailed, but the primary information broadcasting of a poster is at a low information level. It's a, it's a small channel of information. You can't get that much through. So you really have to think about what you're going to leave out. Okay, so that's two things that we need to, to remember, is that we don't have a lot of forced order, and we don't have a lot of bandwidth with a poster. So these are two fundamental aspects of the design of posters. Uh, so we have two dimensionality and we have lack of, of bandwidth. So we have to think about how can we both overcome and use these constraints. We need to design our poster under these constraints. And so the first thing that we should think about is we have fundamentally two to three kinds of audience interaction maybe four. So the first is the drive-by. I'm walking along, maybe I see you by your poster, and I'm just looking at your poster. Maybe I'm doing a survey of the room to find the ones I want, maybe I'm just ambling by, maybe there's a bunch of people in front of you and I'm going to try to remember. So, you know, a bunch of people blocking parts of the poster. I'm just going by quickly. That's the majority, right? Most people are not gonna spend a lot of time at your poster in any kind of crowded event. They're gonna be zooming by, looking for stuff that grabs their interest. They have a finite amount of time. They're not gonna go deep on every poster. They're gonna search out, they're gonna be on the lookout for posters that grab them. So you need to grab them. And for that, for the drive-by, oops, anything below the top third of the space is highly unlikely to get them. Not impossible, but particularly if people, if, if, if the room is crowded, so if the room's not crowded, we have more freedom. But if the room's crowded, they're only gonna be able to see what's up top, unless they push people out of the way. And that gets us to a general principle that this is high salience, that is, this is a place where people direct their attention routinely. So this is a place where you can communicate with a lot of people. And so this is the place where you want to pull them in. You need to give them enough useful information for them to decide whether they should engage with you. Particularly if they're going to come back later too, because you were talking to a bunch of people and, and they, they, they see that you want them to remember you, they remember the topic, think that they should come back and talk with you, and that they're easily able to find you again. So that's what this upper space is, is primarily doing. We have the deep engagement. So you're standing by your poster, somebody walks along, they're pulled in, they start looking at the poster and talking with you. And you have your spiel, you're going back and forth, you're pointing at things, you're able to, to give your whole conversation. At that level, if your poster's not as good, you can compensate for that by having a good engagement, by being good at the mini presentation. But then again, like, like with crappy slides, you know, if your slides are really text heavy or really boring or really hard to read, you can still compensate by being a dynamic speaker. It's still not ideal because however good a compensation you are, you could have done better if the poster is supporting you. You could have done a lot better. But that's the second mode. And there, a lot happens in the middle. This is a place where it's not too high, it's not too low, they don't have to bend down. This is where people naturally converse and this is where their attention naturally goes. So this is the highest salient place for them. Down here, super low salient. Particularly the poster's low and you're dealing with people who aren't of a, of 
whose height puts them well above that. If they have to bend over, it's not going to be that helpful. So the real way to think of this is something I can see from a distance. Where am I at if I'm at eye level, roughly speaking, or a little bit below? These are the height things. And then this is engagement. So you have two, at least two people here. And then there's the deep solo. You've gone off to get food. Somebody comes through and they, sees your, they see your poster and they need to engage with it. So there's almost, and they want to get something from it. So there's almost no interaction. So what the poster says is what the person gets. And that's it. These are three fundamental modes of interaction. If your poster is going to end up in a hallway, it has to really support three the most. If you're in a conference or like if you're going to go to the uh, postgraduate summer showcase, summer research showcase, or at the symposium, these two are what you should be thinking most of because the posters are only really up for the interactive session. You need to catch real people in and then give them, give them what they came to hear. So if we, so now we have some ideas of that different regions of the poster, the physical poster, have different potential values and that we should be thinking for each thing that we put, what are, any, what are these two people getting from it? So if, if you're thinking about your engagement, how are you using it? So if you're going to put something down here, you better make sure that it's high value enough that you're, you can draw people's attention to it. Conversely, you can put it down here because it's, all, it's only of interest to a relatively small number of people, and they're going to be strongly motivated enough that, that they'll spend the time looking down here. Conversely, you want this to be even lower bandwidth because people will be taking it on the fly, so you need to convey a lot in a little. And what I sometimes see is people having you know, a title that goes like this, one line, two line, three lines, four lines, and then a whole bunch of text, which is who they, who, who there are, and the 15 supervisors and RAs who are also working on the project. No. There's two pieces of information that you want to convey up there. You want to convey, the, your project is cool, so what it is and why it's cool, and who you are. If the, if the smallest part of this is your name, then You've missed communicating some really important information. Don't do that. Make sure that your name is clear, distinctive, available. I always ask you who your supervisors are. And make your title short, clear, engaging. You can put some images up here. Sometimes it's nice to have something that, that if you have a good logo or if you have a picture of something that conveys the excitement, then that can do it. But really think of yourself as... You basically have one line. You want this text to be big. You want this to be easy to read. If you can't clearly read it as you walk by the poster in the three seconds that it takes you to saunter past the poster, then you've, you probably don't have a good title. If you're using a lot of deep technical words that there's no hope of the majority of the people wandering around knowing, then again, what are you doing? Except saying, go away, I don't want to talk with you. So try to make this section engaging. Now, so, and we can put that up a little. So let's just say the title, oops, that, that was fun. So we have the, your name, cool title. Okay. Note that having a cool title doesn't mean that it needs to be a gimmicky title, right? Sometimes people have funny puns or something like that, um, cool questions, that's okay, but it doesn't substitute for something that actually is communicative. A slogan about your work is good. Um, I think that, so, you know, anything that kind of gives you a, a hint at what you're really doing, uh, I think is, is quite good. Not easy. Right? I'm not saying any of this is easy, but you should think really hard. Can you distill your project into four to seven words? That's hard. And, and, and still have it be intelligible. That's really hard. 
resist the temptation of long explanatory subtitles. That's typically not good. Okay, so now we have a region. So we've, we, we have our marquee, our, our, our headline, our, our, our attractor. And how do we make use of the rest of the space? So I tend to think of roughly two general layouts. Three, there's three commonly used layouts. One is vertical. That is, you divide the, the poster into two. So in most cases, you can have two or three panels. So that was two. This would be three. And you're vertically oriented. Similarly, you can go horizontal and have either two panels or very commonly, three panels. Now let's, let's just, uh, uh, and the last one is radial, where you have a center thing and things arranged circularly around it. Okay, so let's just talk about the three panel horizontal layout, which is extremely common. And it's a nice layout. It's a very good layout for a number of reasons. Um, it's actually pretty space efficient. Uh, the, one of the problems with vertical vertical layouts in, uh, in, 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 in communities where the primary language is not vertical, so English is a great example of this, is that people aren't, many people aren't as used to going up and down rather than left to right. So that's a bit of a problem. The other problem is that, and it, it's a, maybe a more severe problem, is that um, you know, this, particularly the poster brings down, I have to do a lot more physical motion to get through all of the parts. Um, and, and that means I have to use every level of the poster, which in a crowded room with, with people who might have physical limitations becomes challenging. So the, 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 there's some advantages to this. The other advantage of the horizontal three level is that you can Pretend this doesn't exist. So you can put you can put nice to have but not need to have things down there, and it's easy for everybody to ignore. The other benefit is that this is closer to up here, so you can put things here that elaborate on this and that might be seen by drop drive bys. So I really think that the if you want a default layout, the three panel horizontal arrangement, you could do a lot worse. Um, it's a good workhorse layout. And one common content that people do on this is sort of, here's the problem, here's my, my idea for solving the problem, and then here's some details. You know, have I done some evaluation, how am I going, et cetera, et cetera. Now, remember, just because I put it this way, I don't immediately turn it into a checkerboard by putting you know, a whole bunch of of smaller things. That, that is not there. You should really think about it as you have three breaths. You have the problem, you have your solu proposed solution, and for example, your progress or some methodological ideas. It's very tempting, again, to subdivide this and make it super complex, but it's better to have something like a clear high-level statement of the problem and some sort of examples. Maybe you need a diagram to show where things go wrong, or a graph to show where things go wrong. But the key is, is this is your problem area, and because it's very close to the drive-by sweet spot, you want it to be as, as chunky as possible. If I have to come in really close to understand what's going on, or if I have to follow a lot of complex stuff, it's not gonna happen. So inside this panel, you can have a statement and then elaboration. Similarly here, solution. What's your slogan for the solution? And then elaborate here. This, particularly for the deep interactive, is the sweet spot. The middle is where people spend a lot of time, naturally. That's where our attentions go to. We orient, we look towards the center. So this is one of the high salient areas. Here, it's okay to be to be a little bit choppy because you're, you're you can think of this as closer, I mean, not ideally, not particularly if you're supporting three, but a lot of the time this can be where you put your backup slides, so to speak, or backup information, some detail. But 
if I just, so on that model, if I see this much, I've got it. I've got what, what you're tackling and how you're tackling it. And that's how you should test it. You know, show it to people. Do they, do they understand what you're tackling? Do they get what your proposal is, what your mode of attack is? So assuming you're talking about a particular paper or your project as a whole. I'm a, I, radial ones can be super fun, but again, these are ones that you need to kind of proceed in with caution because they don't really have as natural a structure. You have something in the middle and then stuff, stuff coming off the sides, often little, little side bits. As I said, this can be really interesting, particularly if there's a lot of traffic because people see this and then they see that. And these two things immediately convey a lot and get them into it. Again, you have to make sure that the project that you're trying to describe, the thing that you're trying to describe, you can make it fit usefully into this mode. So, you know, one thing that, that some people do is that they, they put this as, as a central thing and then they try to have kind of problem solving stages. So this is what I did first, this is what I did second, this is what I did third, this is what I did fourth. Not such a great idea because again, understanding what you did in order, uh, maybe I should be looking to what you've done last because that's where the you know, current state of the situations are. And so, but, you, but the highest visibility of the periphery is here. And so that's like, I'm already, oh, that, is this the thing that didn't work? So maybe not so, so useful. On the, it, it, it is quite, this sh probably should be where you put the kind of most interesting and important thing, but they could be different aspects. So this is, you know, one way of tackling the problem. This is one way of evaluating what you're doing there. Um, in general, you wanna to try to figure out how to take your spatial arrangement and map it naturally onto your logical structure so that people can use the spatial arrangement to navigate through your, through your work. Don't do the vertical unless you are consulting with somebody who has a really good idea for how to do the vertical. Um, I, would, I would be more comfortable with people, with you trying for the radial before I would be comfortable trying for the vertical. I think the vertical is really hard to make work. The radial, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for it unless you have an idea of how you're going to interact with it because this is a really good one for, for, for exciting interaction if you can make it work. But you have to really think through how are these things branches or views onto whatever you've talked about in the central. So maybe this is your, your algorithm and you're talking here about the complexity and here about um, some implementation and here about variance. I mean, that could work. But again, once you start thinking of it more linear and you can't really think of it going any which way, it doesn't work out that well. So in short, I recommend the three, three panel horizontal as your starting point. Uh, I think that even if you eventually move to another one, first try that, see how it works out. Uh, and then once you have it in that form, you can think about, explore different transformations to see whether one of these other ones could happen. The radial tends to be less, even less dense than, than to support less dense amounts of information than, than either the vertical or the horizontal paneled approach. So you really have to think about what you're leaving out there and, and whether that's what you want to leave out. So my final, so that's my initial general idea about why you want to do a poster and initial thoughts about how to think about making a poster. I'm more than happy to look at posters um, at any time or drafts of posters and to talk through it. The, the thing I will also say is that your weapon of choice for building posters should not be LaTeX. Um, PowerPoint or Keynote or some presentation software is actually how most people do their posters. And uh, it, it, though it pains my soul to say this, PowerPoint pretty much is the winner. It is, um, it's pretty easy to use. Most of us have it. It's, the, they're all designed for exactly putting things into a 2D space 
uh, sometimes the smart art can be super useful. Um, they have like organization diagrams and process diagrams, which which you can just pop stuff into and it and and it comes out really nice. Um, draw programs, illustration programs, diagramming programs also can be quite helpful uh, or quite reasonable, but they tend to be a little more specialist. Um, if you have to do something to hone your skills, PowerPoint presentation skills and slide building skills works for posters as well. So you would be strengthening um, that ability as well. Yeah, I know it's, 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 it, it feels wrong, but the truth can never be too wrong. And, and I think in the end, using, using some sort of presentation software that really makes your life easy. You really should be thinking of it as a canvas, um, a 2D canvas, rather than almost any other kind of um, ordering. And most you know, LaTeX type things tend to think in terms of order, you know, very strict order and box type approaches. And so not so very nice. Um, and that's it. Thank you.